It is Monday, May 16th, 2022 at 5.05 p.m. The Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting. Uh, all commissioners except for Commissioner O'Connell are present. So Commissioner Prevo, Ambrosino, Smith and Gedankin and uh, General Manager Sullivan and Beth Essery are present as is Ken Nolan and Eli Emerson. Um, we have a quorum. Um, I've, I've been told that uh, Ken has a time constraint. So I would like to suggest that we move the discussion of um, the item that is uh, on the Public Utility Commission's low income uh, rates docket and make that the first item on our agenda. Um, any objection? No. Nope. Nope. Hearing, hearing none, um, that change is approved. Are there any other changes to the agenda? Okay, so, yeah. yeah. So, so Ken, if you can take off with those bullet items I gave you and we'll go from there, that would be fantastic. Let me see if I can pull them up, make sure I don't miss anything here. Um, yeah, so the, the history of this actually goes back like 11 years. Um, the Public Utility Commission first started trying to implement these low income rates over a decade ago. And they actually concluded at that time that they did not have the authority to uh, force a statewide program or really to force utilities to implement these rates. Um, GMP decided to go forward with their own program as a settlement with the AARP and that ultimately got approved and has been in place for a number of years. And so this, this whole discussion went away um, for several years. Uh, pop back up and- Hang on. Can you also share, Ken, what BEPS's position was back then? Sure, our position has been consistent all along that the PUC does not have authority to implement statewide program or to require the tariff. And for municipal utilities is not necessary given your governance structure, um, not-for-profit status, and the, way, the way our business um, is structured, it's counterproductive to do low-income rates. And we've carried that position for over a decade. Um, so, so this came back up in 2020, the PUC started doing a number of workshops and asking for data, but they never really got into the, the legal question about whether they had the authority to do anything. Um, and they've held workshops on and off about every six months, they've asked for more information. Um, we've continue to make filings in response to any questions that they've put forward saying, we don't think this is the best, best thing to do. We don't think you have the authority. Um, and it, they'll ask for filing, it goes away, it comes back six months later. Uh, this is the first time, this order came out in April 26th. Um, this is the first time we've actually seen them do a, a legal analysis now changing position and claiming that they believe they have authority to require some kind of tariff filing or statewide program. Um, so we first reviewed this internally when the order came out, we sent it out to the VEPSA board. It was discussed at our board meeting a week ago um, where I believe it was unanimous. Um, there was a lot of conversation about how this was inappropriate, unnecessary, um, a lot of discussion over how hard we should fight. In other words, should we be willing to take this to the Supreme Court, um, which would be the step if you challenge the PUC's jurisdiction, um, and discussion about the, the optics of the municipals, you know, making that challenge and what would it look like uh, to take that position and oppose low income rates politically. Um, legally, we think we have a strong case. 
Um, but politically, do we want to make that case became a pretty big focus of conversation. Um, I'm in the process right now of getting a legal opinion from our attorney, Bill Ellis, um, around whether the PUC has jurisdiction. Um, I've talked with him verbally about that, and he continues to be of the opinion that they do not. Uh, we're getting that opinion in writing, and I expect to have it before Wednesday. Um, the VEPSA Board of Directors has asked for a special meeting Wednesday morning, um, two days from now, with this being the only agenda item to dig deeper into what our position is going to be. But as I sit here tonight, uh, what we're trying to do is essentially a three-step. We're, um, we're gathering the data that the PUC has asked for uh, to the extent we have it. We believe we have most of that information. Um, we're starting to look at what modeling would look like, although I'm personally of the opinion that if we submit modeling information, we essentially are giving <laughs> the argument that uh, they have a right to do this. So we're not sure we're going to file anything on the modeling side, but we're preparing in case the board decides they want us to go there. Um, and we're expecting after the discussion on Wednesday to start crafting um, a filing from VEPSA, which again, will reiterate, we don't think you have the authority. We don't think this is necessary. It's counterproductive. Um, and then going into if, and we've got to craft this language carefully, um, but we believe we're going to be filing comments that if the PUC forges ahead and decides to do a program, it should not be statewide it should be tailored either VEPSA specific amongst the VEPSA membership or individually utility specific. Um, but our first position is don't have the authority and it's counterproductive to do these rates. And this, this timeline we are not happy with. Um, several members suggested they need more time and we I expect that's going to be one of our comments as well. That here's the information, but to get a positions and opinions from individual utilities, you need to give them more time, especially given the governance structure and the need to work with elected boards. Um, and we think the PUC will will give that time if it's asked for. I guess I think I held your points, Mike. Um, yeah, I think. So I'm happy to answer questions from there. Perfect. So, so, Ken, why is it counterproductive? Because the, in order to pay the low income uh, discount that the PUC is talking about, you have to raise money from all rate payers. So you're essentially doing cross ups. It's, it's very similar to net metering, where you're collecting money from certain rate payers to then pay others. And in, in most cases, um, and I actually had a conversation with the DPS today on this topic. I pointed out that for most municipal utilities, uh, your rates are already lower than the low income rates that GMP is offering to customers. <laughs> so you're providing, you're providing a discount. You'd, you'd be asked to provide a discount that is basically meaningless, um, but raise the money from all your other customers in order to compensate a few uh, low income folks. Well, it's not a few, that's part of the problem. We have a lot of low income customers. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what portion, you know, it depends where you draw the line, but if you're looking at the 150 to 200% of poverty line level, um, I think we're talking about a substantial proportion of our customers. Um, mm -hmm. The other difference though, um, with to answer Michael's question with, with GMP, is GMP has a profit margin built into their rates. So to the extent that they wanna play with things, they can take a lower profit in, and, and reduce their profit margin slightly and, and contribute to the cost of the subsidy to the low-income customers. We don't have a profit margin. So anything we take from one customer, we've gotta get from somebody else. And, it's, and it's honestly- zero, It's a zero sum game. Yeah, but GMP right now is not giving up profit. What they're doing is they're putting a dollar charge on every customer's bill. That's going into a pot that then they can use to give a 25% discount 
to anyone who qualifies under the low income program. But as a theoretical matter, if they had enough takers and they and the dollar or whatever it was wasn't enough, yep. they have another source of revenue that they that, can use. That is true, yep. and and we don't. Um, so it's 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 a, it's a zero sum game, and a customer who is just past whatever that threshold is is falling off a cliff because they're paying the subsidy, not getting subsidized. Um, Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you uh, the con I had a chat with Jim Porter from the DPS. I think Eli probably knows Jim fairly well. Um, the department is trying to figure out what they're going to say in response to this order. And as of today, they're leaning toward telling the PUC they still don't believe that the commission has legal authority to do this and they should go to the legislature to get that authority if they feel they need to move. Well, um, this so is this is a question that I had, should we be going to our legislators and, and, and asking them to make clear that the commission doesn't have the authority? Um, I, I, I take your point, Ken, about the optics of this, but first of all, I mean, this is, this is policy making with no data to support it. And, and I, we, we certainly don't have the data. You don't have the data. I actually did an analysis for Commonwealth Edison 40 odd years ago uh, when the issue of lifeline rates came up and looking at the correlation between income and electricity usage. And admittedly, it was a different service territory in a different time period, but it was a very weak correlation. Um, and with the end result that if you did something that that is subsidizing lower income customers on the basis theoretically on the basis of electricity usage and this isn't a lifeline right you wind up not helping the people that you intended to help here it's a little bit different if it's like gmp's program where you just fall off a cliff wherever yeah. that line is drawn um yeah i i think there, there'll be a a place for the legislators to weigh in. It, it feels to me like it's a little bit early for that. Um, the PUC is not going to be able to just gather this data and then issue an order. There's going to be some process after this filing. And I think once we see what the other commenters say, and again, I'm hearing we're going to be saying there's no jurisdiction. So likely the Department of Public Service will be saying that. I've been told WEC is going to take that position as well. Um, my understanding is Stowe will take that position. So I think at that point, having more of the legislative people weigh in and, and support what we've said would be useful. Um, does, it, does it make sense? I mean, one of the things I have to say, I was, I was disturbed that this was the first that we were hearing about this. And I've been on the, this board for a very long time and I hadn't heard about this before. Um, and, and I would have wondered whether the PUC hearing, not just from VEPSA, which I think it should, but also from the VEPSA members who can speak about what their communities are like and what the needs of their communities mm -hmm. are, that, that that would be a powerful thing. And we didn't have the opportunity to do that. Uh, because we didn't know about it. Um, and I don't know how we get around that, but I, you know, I, what, given what the, the PUC is asking for, I mean, it's pretty dry stuff I and mean, we're not in the position to do our own modeling. Um, right. And, yeah. and I, I certainly take your point um, about. We, we have though, I mean, the problem we're running into on this docket, when is it, I mean, it, it it pops its head up every six months, give or take. And we have weighed in before with having members send in comments, you know, two or three years ago. Um, so I, I guess I have a different opinion as to whether the members have been aware of this or have weighed in because in the, in the past when this has come up, we have had individual utilities submit comments this has been talked about, in, I don't know, um, 10 or 12 EPSA board meetings over multiple years. Uh, 
the difference here is, and this just came up, the April 26th kind of came out of the blue. We hadn't seen anything for six or eight months before, previously. Um, but the, them weighing in and, and changing their legal interpretation is new. It's brand mm -hmm. new. And it's, I think, going to change the way we approach this. So there seemed to be at the board meeting to me, Ken, uh, there was kind of two sides of, of, you know, half of the board felt this way and half of the board felt that way. And my position was, well, what changed and do they actually have the legal authority to do what, what they're doing? And that's, you know, you're investigating that. So that's where my head was going. But others, the, the others that felt strongly in another way were primarily about the public view of, oh, Hardwick Electric doesn't support, you know, low income rates. Well, aren't they the bad guy? And a lot of the other GMs were not comfortable go, uh, being in that position. So I can't, I think it's kind of a split team there. And that's why I asked for the special meeting Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say it's about a third we're willing to go the Supreme Court route and challenge, legally challenge the authority. Um, and two thirds were, at least as of the last meeting, were, well, yeah, we could do that, but the optics. And how do we make a filing with the PUC that gets the point across and not have to take the court route at this point, uh, potentially? And that's where I can see the legislative angle coming into play. If we can line up support for, you don't have the authority in the PUC filing, and then following that, get some legislative uh, comments filed saying they agree. Um, then I think we can start to make the, the PUC second guess itself. Uh, we may still find ourselves fighting an uphill battle, but at least I think they'll have to think twice. Uh, I, I have a question for Eli since, since uh, he's our lawyer and he is on this call. Um, what's, what is your view on, on the PUC's authority? And, 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 and secondly, if you think that they don't have the authority, do we lose our opportunity to challenge this by waiting? Opportunity. Um, so I don't, I haven't done like a detailed legal analysis. I've certainly read the statute that allows it. And if it's consistent with every other way, the state of Vermont, interprets things, they'll interpret it as broadly as possible. And so, I don't know, I, 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 I'm sure there are some very good arguments against it, but I wouldn't hold my hope that the Supreme Court is gonna side with utilities over the PUC as to their jurisdiction. And also to the degree that the Supreme Court, you know, may decide that, then the legislature is likely going to just give the PUC the jurisdiction that they want. So, but I do agree that if you're going to challenge it, this is the time, like you have to do it quickly. You have 30 days for a motion to reconsider. So you'd have to file a motion to reconsider of that order. And it looks like BEPS is sort of gearing up to be able to do that. So I think the timing, timing there works. Um, that's how you'd preserve your argument to the Supreme Court I don't think you can wait till the docket is resolved. You have the order sitting there and you um, just do it interlocutory. I guess my question is, is almost a little bit of a, and I'm not saying this is the way to do it, but it is at least a consideration to start thinking about, especially from Hardwick's perspective, is if you assume the world is headed towards some sort of low income rate, what is most favorable to Hardwick? Um, and if, if you're arguing and I think each one of the one of the challenges is that it's probably different. I think I, I heard today that you know Morrisville has a huge commercial and industrial base, which makes them very different than than Hardwick um, from sort of a demographics perspective. But what is the right low income program? Is it possible that you know to sort of shape? shape it should Hardwick be arguing for a statewide pooled program so that balances out the disadvantages you have in your district do it through VEPSA I don't know I'm like as you've all pointed out there really is not a lot of data to make this on but I, 
I almost think at some point after 11 years of having this percolate is to assume that this is where the state is headed. It wants a low income rate for every, and that, and to at least consider what might be in Hardwick's best interest um, and consider advocating for that, which, you know, again, I don't have an answer for that. I just think when we, so I represented at the time, it was the, what used to be the group of 14 municipal electric utilities um, that participated in the low income docket. It was called GMU back then, because I think Stowe had left, so it wasn't quite 14. But I remember a good portion of what we were arguing and what Ken has pointed out is that there are just certain characteristics of a municipal utility which make them sort of have a better ability to address an individual low-income customer's needs than a uniform program sort of layered across the whole thing. A ton of it was based on we just don't have the information to be able to tell you what a good structure for a program is. A lot of it had to do with the... Um, a lot of it had to do with, with um, you know, the makeup of the customers, whether there was a huge low income population or whether there were a bunch of residential pay, uh, rate payers or just, you couldn't sort of um, put the AARP proposal uh, to fit it, to make it work for the co-ops and the munis where it would work for GMP and CVPS. So I think there's a lot of that going on, but what's clear is, you know, after 11 years, they're, they're still sort of pushing it. So um, whether or not you can hold it off forever by saying muni, munis are really unique and have low rates to begin with, it's possible. Or, you know, at some point it may just become something like you know, the efficiency program where it's just sort of universally applied throughout the state. Um, just my thought that you may want to consider what a good program looks like in case the sort of pushing against it ever happening um, doesn't work. It is, 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 is the horse out of the barn in terms of a completely different approach? I, I mean, I, 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 the economist in me says that if there's an income distribution problem you deal with it through tax and transfer mechanisms and you don't tie it to what people are paying for electricity. If, you know, you, yeah. you, you, and if, if the state feels that electricity is, is an essential service, which I happen to think it is, then have state funds that are funded by the state progressive income tax Fund, fund, you know, assistance to low-income ratepayers. Um, yeah, my, my. To me, that's a far more equitable approach than 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 doing this uh, through through electric rates. Yeah, I think even in Vermont, the legislature isn't going to essentially pass a tax to support the program. But if they're not going to if they're not going to do that, then why are they going to support doing a tax? that in fact is gonna hurt some of the people who can least afford it. Yeah, I mean, I think I would defer to Ken on a lot of these things. I think even, I think probably even to Ken, right? GMP probably is gonna be a big, uh, it is not gonna to wanna to participate in a statewide program since they've got their program kind of locked in. So you have that barrier to a statewide program to begin with. Which then, which then goes to the other piece. Well, what, but what makes them holy? I mean, you know, if if their service territory is relatively more affluent than the rest of the state, and I don't know if it is or if it isn't, but if it is, then then we're better off having a single statewide program, where at least it's not all on the backs of the 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 poor, but not poor enough ratepayers in our service territory. Um, it, yeah, in our in our conference this morning, Steve Farman and Eli and I talked around that circle, and and we kind of concluded that well, if GMP doesn't want it, you you probably do. <laughs> it was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I I I mean the fact is we don't have the data. I mean I I, I was spent part of this afternoon looking at income data, trying to find income data 
which was not an easy thing. But what, and I was just looking at Hardwick and not the surrounding towns. But I mean, Hardwick's income data is, you know, whether you're talking median or average or, you know, on a variety of things, is less than the state averages. So all other things being equal, we're better off in a state pool than than trying to do right. this on our own. Yeah, and that honestly, but I don't know if that's true if you take GMP out of it. And honestly, that's part of the struggle for VEPSA with this is that half the members are in the position you're describing where they would prefer if, is there, if there's going to be a program, they would prefer statewide. And half the members want to run their own destiny because you know, they believe they have fewer low income residents in the state average and they can design their own program themselves. So we're we're trying to walk the middle ground and create space for individual utilities to file additional comments if they feel they need to uh, and not, I mean, it's very easy to say, you don't need this program, we're different. You know, we all wanna get away from the transfer of wealth and that sort of thing. When we have to start weighing in on what should a program look like, that's much harder for us to do on a kind of VEPSA wide approach. Um, the, the one thing I'll reply to the GMP concept, I think normally they would take the position that statewide program's not good. They've got a problem too right now though. They've only got about a third of the customers who are eligible for, the pro, for their program signing up. And even at collecting a dollar from each customer per month, their pot of money they've set aside is growing. And they're getting more and more pressure from the, uh, the regulators to figure out how to move money out the door. So they actually might view a statewide program where <laughs> that pressure on them goes away uh, to be a good thing. But, but without knowing what the data is, we don't really know whether a statewide program is better for us or not. Um, and that's so it, it, it seems like it's premature to be arguing. We need, we need more information to, 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 make a, to take a view on that. Coming back, Eli, why did the, the PUC conclude, I take your point about how, how statutes get interpreted. Um, and, I read, and I read the, the order. Why did the PUC think that they didn't have jurisdiction before? Um. So this would have been an order from like 2011. Um, I believe they just looked at the language, the specific language in the statute, and it was very specific. They interpreted it to saying they could impose a rate on a utility in a particular service territory, not a broader look that they could combine service territories um, and pool revenue and then distribute it across different service territories. So it was really kind of a specific reading of the language in the statute. And I think as Ken points out, they, you know, they, they decided they don't like that interpretation anymore. So without anything other than just saying, oh, we've changed our mind. Uh, the language looks good to us. Um, they basically just did a 180 and said they can do a statewide program now. So there was never a lot of there's never a lot of explanation in 2011, and there's even less explanation in 2022. Yeah, but that interpretation, I mean, implicates a lot of other things. If they can say, oh, this low income program could be statewide, what stops them from coming back? <laughs> you know, deciding other utility activities can be managed statewide. Um, yeah, and so, so, but to support that, the two programs that I can think of that are somewhat statewide are Efficiency Vermont, which has its own enabling legislation and net metering, which has its own enabling legislation. Is this, it, this is nowhere near as specific as those two separate sets of statutes. So you can make that argument that there, you have to be much more specific to create a statewide program like that. And this uh, very, it's like one sentence, This the the section that deals with this, not a lot of detail in there. I apologize. I've got a, a conference call on our project 10 uh, overhaul. So I, they do, I do need to jump off. Um, if you want me back, I'm happy to come back. 
Um, Mike, I think you're going to be at the board meeting tomorrow and we can follow up after that conversation. Wednesday, Wednesday, yes. Oh, Wednesday, yes, Wednesday. Thank you very much, Ken. Much Thank appreciated. You, Ken. Appreciate it. Good night. Seems clear to me, Mike, that um, Hardwick is one of the poorest towns in Vermont. I don't think there's any question about that. And probably statewide would be to the benefit of Hardwick Electric, but I'm not sure that that's particularly relevant right now. There's a paucity of data. So what the, what the board was trying to come to consensus on at the last meeting at VEPSA was do we, can we, and do we and can we uh, collectively take a position here? And the Public Utility Commission wants to know whether we would support our own low income rate, doing it on our own and everybody doing their own thing on their own, having a statewide program excluding Green Mountain Power, so everybody but GMP, would be option number two. And then a statewide program, including GMP, would be option number three. And I, I really need direction from you all to go into that meeting Wednesday and have some kind of direction that we think. And, and I know we don't have a bunch of data uh, to work with, but just philosophically, and I think from the gut, where you think we should be headed because this is definitely a governance and policy issue. It's your baby. Well, we don't have to take a view either. I mean, it, true, it, that's true. The, I mean, what the what the order again? Um, you like correct me if I'm misreading this, but what the commission is asking for is data that that has to be provided for HED. Um, an estimate of the number of low income customers in our service territory, which. I assume that EPSA is going through census tract data or something, but I don't. I don't know that they have that data by by census tract. Um, and our service territory is rather irregular, so who knows? Yeah. Um, then customer counts we should have. Um, I don't know what they they talk about residential a daily access charge. Who has a daily access charge? <laughs> I've Green heard. Mountain Power has one. They, has their one? Okay. their monthly charge is a daily access fee. Yeah. Okay. So it's our customer charge uh, for residentials and the uh, residential energy rate. With if, if there's a block with a block, so that the 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 main thing is is this low income data, which. I mean, the crazy thing is the government should have that. They have the tax information. They have everybody's income in the state. And they can aggregate it any way they want to. And if they can, you know, they could, they could, they could come up with a number for our service territory far better than we can. Um, so I, I had um, a suggestion on our call today, and this is definitely more for Mike to take back, take back to Vepsa, but that you can provide the data that you have, but essentially express a willingness to try to um, get to provide the information that the PUC is looking for, but you really have to ask a bunch of questions as to how do we gather this information? What are you looking for? If you're talking about a Hardwick specific program, what features are you wanting? Do you want arrearage forgiveness, which was part of the GMP program? So initially every customer had six months to apply for arrearage forgiveness. So there was a pot of money that had to go to that and then you know, what's the discount? Uh, how does it apply to each rate class? Uh, so to me, sort of participating in it, you know, to sort of give the effect that you're participating in it, but you really aren't in a position to provide any information to them until you get a lot of more direction and feedback from the PUC. I think their questions, especially, you know, Know, provide an estimate of whether you could offer this program. I mean, without some sort of framework for the program you're supposed to be applying, I don't know how you'd ever answer that question. I, I Well, again, they're not asking that. Right now, they're only asking for data. And then they're saying they encourage modeling of the, of the three scenarios or alternatives. I don't know. 
and and this I think goes to your point, Eli. How the scenario is simply say a statewide program. Okay, what's the program that you're that you're doing? What 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 are the you know you can create an infinite number of statewide programs. Yeah. Um, well, that's what I, but I see I see an opportunity. I guess this is a as sort of a strategy is to to be willing to participate in this process. So you come across it, but at least identify the many, many, many unanswered questions that the PUC is really not addressing here. By they're just sort of putting the burden on each individual uh, utility to think about it in its own perspective and then file. I just, I don't see how that is, they're gonna get any useful information back from the utilities doing that. But I would, you know, Mike, from your, one of the things that it seemed clear from Ken's perspective is that there's probably going to be different groups of VEPSA members. Like it just sounds, you know, you're probably different than Ludlow, right? Which is, imagine kind of a wealthy community. Um, and, you know, you might be different than Morrisville because they have a bunch of, you know, they're a village center and they have commercial and industrial base there. So I don't know if there's a way, like once you've gotten past this initial filing um, and Ken said to do it kind of open-ended is to figure out who's like you and try to at least pool together some resources of people who are more like you. I would presume maybe Barton and Orleans are a little more like Hardwick. Um, uh, probably like Enosburg would be a good yeah. comparable. Um, GMP charges, what did, uh, like I'm having a brain cramp. What was the fee for the industrials that GMP charges? 60 bucks a month or something? 55, I think. 55 for an industrial and a dollar for a residential. Well, we're like 92% residential. So we wouldn't have any industrial or commercial amount to really consider. And Morrisville Water and Light has, they're probably 60% residential. So they, they aren't really a good model to compare with us. I, so I just, as the ski area, yeah, I don't, I don't think any of us are that much alike really when you get just, customer accounts. If, if you take the position, and I'm not saying this is true, but if you take the position that at some point, every utility is going to have to offer some sort of low income rate, then what is best for Hardwick may be different than what's best for Morrisville or Ludlow. And I just think you need to acknowledge that in that discussion, that there should be some freedom for individual utilities to act in their interest here and advocate for what they, you know, what they think is going to be better for their ratepayers. Well, what would be best for our ratepayers if we assume that they're low income? Without having, based on the fact that it's a bunch of residential customers and there's a lot of low income and probably a lot of people who hover right above the income threshold, uh, I have to imagine if you can spread out the pain of subsidizing, what would be a pretty big, uh, you know, would have to be a pretty big amount of money to pay for that, that discounted rate to spread it out over all of Vermont's ratepayers. But that's, that's just, that's my assumption based on what I know. You need actual data to say that that's the case because you'd never want to advocate for something that ended up being wrong. You know, maybe doing it on a service territory basis would be most advantageous to Hardwick. Um, so you'd want to advocate for that. I just do think that it's, it's, it's been long enough now. Clearly, I, I'm going to guess that the PUC was fine just sending out a memo every six months saying, what's the status of this? Give us more information. And then given COVID and probably pressure from the legislature that they're now sort of actively pushing it. So I think it's gonna happen. I mean, New Hampshire has a statewide low income tax plan or uh, sort of surcharge on the bill and then applies it uh, it's available for customers, so. Hampshire yeah, doesn't have an income tax. Um, doesn't have half the taxes that we have. I just did a back of the envelope calculation. Um, 
if if our residential revenue is uh, well, I just I just took the cumulative budgeted revenue through March and multiplied it by four, just to get annual revenue, and then said if twenty five percent of our customers are low income, then that's 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 one point four over $1.4 million worth of revenue. If we then just divide that by the 3,000 customers who aren't low income, that comes out to $480 a year. That's a hefty yeah. hit. Yeah. That's, that's like, that's like a, a, a basically what an eight, 9% rate increase. Or more. That, that's taking the whole amount that they would pay, not a percentage. Or you didn't take a percentage of what their bill was. You took. Oh, the you're right. Amount. You're right. You're right. So it'd be twenty five percent of that. It'd still be over a hundred dollars a year. Yeah. It'd be like one hundred and twenty five dollars a year. One hundred twenty. One hundred twenty five dollars a year. Uh, all of this is this is a gross analysis, but yeah. But yeah. That's I still I know this, but I haven't looked at my electric bill in a long time because it gets automatically paid. But when you get your monthly electric bill, is there a sales tax on the bottom? I don't even remember anymore. Or is it just a utility rate? You pay, have... your taxes are paid. Um, I have my Green Mountain Power bill right here, and it doesn't show any sales tax on it. No, Mike, I have my bill out here too. And, and there's no know. sales tax. Yeah, there's no sales tax on the residentials. Okay. The problem, yeah, the obvious problem, and Lynn, I thought your, 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 you know, your rough back of the envelope was good is it's just simple math. And I think that's what Eli was pointing to is that we have too large a proportion of our ratepayers who would qualify and too few to spread that over. Yeah. And so we need to be a receiving jurisdiction. You know? uh, yeah. In other words, we, we need more affluent parts of the state to send money here to subsidize our, our ratepayers who are in need or it's going to be tough. And then it has to be that I don't know how you come up with a scheme that's somewhat progressive so that you don't have that cliff where we pick some arbitrary definition of people who need help. And then if you're just on the wrong side of that definition, now you're financing your neighbor who earns, you know, $1 a year less than yeah. you. And, and are they paying, you know, and you've got all gradations of income uh the devil's in the detail on this well, thing but that's why the rates are a completely inappropriate way to do it yeah it belongs yeah. it belongs in in the in the in the tax mechanism it needs to be something that the state budgets and you know just like just like they do on on homestead exemptions they could do something on on income tax um, and do some kind of a tax credit if you're just um, from 2011, just as as part of the screening threshold they use for the GMP and then the CVPS uh, low income rate was 2%. Like it should be no imposed no more than a 2% increase on the customer as a whole or the rest of the customers. Um, and you know, both of theirs were like one and a half percent impact to rates by doing it. And then, um, you know, every once in a while, if they had enough information from a co-op or a muni, they'd run it, and you know, you'd be talking about high single digits to double digit impact from trying to run it based on the numbers they had at the time, which weren't very good. But again, so that two percent was sort of a screen. Anything above that was too much of a rate impact to bother or to impose a low income rate scheme on a particular utility? Well, if my back of the envelope is approximately right, it would be like an 8% increase. Yeah, so four so times. Just, 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 I, think, I think my bill is probably pretty average. I, I tend to have 110, $120 a month. And if it was 120, I just took one twelfth of that and that, you know, that's, that's, that's 8.3%. Um, 
basically it's it's charging the average customer an extra bill every yep. year um i guess the question is what do we tell mike for this meeting do any of us want to be at that meeting um i think we would like to stay wide i agree that And we can certainly have a follow-up special meeting of our own, and I can give you the whole lowdown if if you all want to. Before we jump on statewide, we've been talking about Hardwick. Hardwick serves other, you know, we serve other areas. Craftsbury is not low income. Well, Greensboro. Well, remember when yeah. uh, Vince made some some. Uh, Suggestions that Casper was low income. Both Lynn and I looked at a lot of low, a lot of income stuff for the for towns in Vermont, and boy, is that data hard to find and all screwed up and contradictory. I mean, at one point, I found a listing with Greensboro Bend more wealthy per capita by household than Stowe. Um, so, I mean, all of that stuff is based on on state income tax, I think. And so the wealthy people in these towns, Grassbury, Stowe, Greensboro, uh, who live in Florida may not appear in certain data. This is really hard to do. But but again, there are people, you know, Woodbury, again, I was looking at data and I looked quickly, Woodbury's median income, Woodbury has some poor people, but they also have some very affluent people. Yes, they do. Uh, and um, I didn't look at the Wilkett data. I mean, we serve, we serve parts of a lot of town. I don't know where the number, I guess what, this is by way of saying, I don't feel confident where, when you look at all of our customers, where the numbers fall out. Yeah, you can't look at median or average. You have to look at the census data. You gotta right. look at- Right, and I couldn't find distribution data. Um, <clears throat> In the in the little bit of time that I was 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 looking, um, I mean, logically, it seems like probably statewide would be would be better. Um, statewide is also probably harder to implement, which gives it a, um, in the in the, and and statewide has. To the extent that people object, then there's a greater likelihood of, of having some effect on the legislature um, if it's statewide. I don't know that I'm thinking out loud here. Um, it gets the administrative components out of our hands too. Yep. Somebody yeah. else has to deal with it. I'm coming, I mean, there's a long way to go before anything takes fully takes enough shape to, to be voted on and implement. So this is more of like a preliminary, give Mike what he needs to give it a preliminary nudge. Our voice through Mike is a preliminary nudge. And I, I, would, I think we're talking the right thing saying, push it towards statewide. But the other piece that we haven't discussed is the question of appealing this order for an, excuse me, an interlocutory decision on the commission's authority. And if we, don't do it now, we don't get to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's unclear to me whether BEPSA is going to do it because well, it sounds like there's yeah. a split in, in the membership. And I think we need to be prepared to, to do it. I don't like the politics of appealing it. Well, okay, so just a couple I, of things. There, there are definitely other utilities that are going to appeal it. So I don't think, um, I don't think that there's, you know, the, the question is going to get answered because there will be other utilities outside of the VEPSA group that will do it. But we could um, group with them, Eli, when, when it takes shape, we could become a party to. to well, that. I, I'm not, I guess I'm not, I'm just saying, you know, if ultimately you, here's the thing is you could be saying, hey, we really like the idea of a statewide program, but we're a little worried that the PUC doesn't have the authority to do it. Uh, we really need to make sure that's the case by sort of mm -hmm. challenging this law. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And then if it turns out they don't, then the legislature can fix mm -hmm. whatever the problem was. 
I do think though that it's going to be a lot better uh, if the PUC is the one that designs a statewide program rather than the legislature. So you may you may want to know whether you know they have the authority to do this because <laughs> again, it, it, you know Stowe may Stowe, which is a very wealthy place with a ton of commercial uh, customers probably would much rather do it on an individual basis. So they have an incentive to want to say the PUC can't do it so that there's no, you know, they're not going to have to share their wealth with their neighboring communities. So I just think that, um, you know, if you really are uh, thinking you support a statewide program, then you probably want the statute to allow this to happen but you need to make sure that everyone's in agreement that the statute actually lets the PUC do this. So I'm not, I, and I think I get the sense VEPSA will challenge it, whether or not Hardwick, Hardwick wants to be a part of that challenge or not. Eli, can, do you read the statute as allowing the commission on its own to impose a, a discount or a, or a tariff for low income customers on its own, yeah, that's, on, on an individual utility. So I, this is a little bit of a difference um, from what Ken said, and I'm not saying I'm definitely right. I believe the 2011 order specifically said we could impose this on any, we could impose a low income rate structure on any individual utility within their service territory within their rate payers. What we can't do is pool all of them together in the state of Vermont and create one program through the state of Vermont. Okay. Uh, because they had to, because they imposed one individually inside GMP service territory and at the time inside CVPSs. So they clearly had the authority to do it within a specific utility. They made a ruling that they couldn't pool together utilities statewide. And then just a month ago, they, overturned that decision and said, no, we actually feel like based on the wording in the statute, which hasn't changed since 2011, I don't think, uh, but the wording in the statute would allow us to pool together the utilities and either create one uh, among the non-GMP utilities or among all the utilities in the state. So, Okay, so so if, if if you're reading and if the commission's previous decision was that they could impose it on an individual utility, then then we probably if we participate at all, we should be arguing that that they have the authority, not that they don't. Yeah, I mean they could come in. That's the thing is if you think that um, an individual utility specific plan isn't feasible in Hardwick, then that's about, you know, previous to a month ago, that was the only thing they could do based on the enabling legislation. Now I, with this I decision. Even, I don't even know how we would, would, would uh, I mean, the, the thing is, if it were utility specific, we don't have income data on individual customers. We don't have the right to information about individual customers. We don't have a right to their tax returns. We don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's 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 a it, implementing it is is crazy. So unless it was something like GMP does, where it goes to DCFS to vet customers first, um, we have no way of 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 of, of knowing. I think it's impossible um, for us to do it. Well, it's not if it goes to DS. It, what GMP does is GMP doesn't vet people's eligibility. DCFS does. People have to, the way the GMP program works is people have to go to DCFS, apply. DCFS then gets, looks at, gets the information. They decide if the person's eligible, then they send a notice back to the customer and back to GMP and the customer has to reapply every year. Well, I mean, how, I mean, we couldn't do that on our own. No, that was again. That was well, another. Well, we we could we could. I mean, if 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 yeah. if if um, if we have a tariff that's for low income customers, tariff X. Okay, 
and we don't decide who qualifies. DCFS tells us who qualifies. And if DCFS says they qualify, then we, then we bill them under tariff X. It, that's, that's the way the GMP thing works. I think the problem with it is that most low income customers don't know that it's there. Well. And, and, and my guess is that DCFS isn't, isn't publicizing it a whole lot. Well, it sounds like Eli is telling us to be open at least right now to the possibility of supporting the PUC in their quest to have power. We don't want to necessarily say yes now, but you know, maybe maybe we should join with other utilities in going to the Supreme Court. In any case, we like the idea of a of a, a state decision, and we're not sure about local right now, and we're not we're not sure about going to the Supreme Court, but we're open to that. So Eli, I asked you a week or so ago to review the, the history and and the new order. And you you shared the same perspective with me that the public service board had previously taken the position that they could impose on a single utility, but could not impose on all utilities in a statewide program. And is that that's what you're that's what you're still telling us you believe the original decision was? It couldn't have been different. Yes, it couldn't have been different because they imposed one on GMP and CVPS. Did they impose so, it or, 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 or they voluntarily said, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll do it? Yeah, I thought GMP voluntarily did it. Well, I, so that... The petition was brought by AARP to impose it on GMP and CVPS. The first phase of it, um, I think you would say that, yes, there was a settlement between AARP and GMP and CVPS to do it, and all the other utilities didn't participate and essentially objected to having to do it. Is that because GMP willingly did it? Uh, I don't but know. It was a PUC docket. I don't know how the PUC could approve it if it didn't have the authority to approve it. Anyways, um, yeah. so I don't think the, so the I, reason I, I'm the reason I'm yeah. asking is where where are we at Hardwick Electric going to be if VEPSA Council says absolutely X? They don't have the authority. And you're telling us, nope, why they have the authority. But I'm worried that that's where we're going to be sitting. If so, we're talking about on uh, the authority to do it on a utility specific basis? Nope, just statewide. Oh, or I don't both. think, yeah. I don't think I disagree. I don't disagree with what Ken said at all that their position used to be that they couldn't do it statewide. And now they've changed it to say that they can do it statewide. And that's that change is exactly what VEPSA is considering challenging. Right. Uh, I don't, I don't, I did take that to mean that they were challenging that the PUC couldn't impose it on a specific utility. Cause literally that's the, I don't know what the purpose of the statute would be if they didn't if they couldn't impose it on a specific utility. That might, I don't, I, as far as I understand, there's no disagreement between me and what Ken said. It's just a question about whether or not you wanna challenge that decision that came out about a month ago, because it's possible that that's the most favorable outcome for hardware. We don't know that, but it's possible being able to do it statewide designed by the PUC is exactly how you would wanna do it. Would we even have standing to challenge it? We haven't been a party to this docket. Uh, you're a party to the docket. You're just acting through VEPSA. I think you would want to file a notice. But also at this point, it's not, it's, it's not even a, like an adjudication. It's more along the lines, these outside of adjudication type proceedings. It's just like 
uh, informational hearings, public hearings, data gathering. They don't have a specific proposal yet. So I don't think there's the same rules about being a party. But then again, <laughs> well, let me say, but they, the decision I believe um, that came out a, a, about a month ago was an, sort of an opening order, opening this type of investigation. And within it, it contained that decision, which I think is what all the utilities are thinking about challenging now. But previous to that, it had really just been um, information gathering docket, not one that was actively pursuing any particular outcome. If everybody makes a request to have more time, the PUC will probably say, okay, does that put off the amount of time that you have to go to the Supreme Court? Do you have more than 30 days then? Um, no, only if they, would, you know, they put a stay or withdrew their decision with that holding. Uh, you do really do need to challenge it unless they would withdraw that, that holding or reconsider it. Um, one other thing that I think VEPSA is holding out the possibility for, which is that if everyone just makes this seem really complicated and hard to do, meaning the PUC has questionable jurisdiction, nobody has good data, even if you had good data, there's no program that would work very well, that it would just you know make PUC and AARP throw up their hands again and say, Ah, it's not worth it. We don't want to have to have this fight. Um, so I think there is some holding out hope that if everyone just makes it seem really complicated, the PUC will back off and not implement a low income rate, which is certainly what happened last time. But that was 11 years ago. We hadn't just gone through COVID. Uh, I think it's a different political climate now than it was back then. I think they're probably motivated to see this through rather than just walk away from it when it gets too complicated. But that's certainly what happened last time. You basically just, it was really easy to do it for CV, not easy, but easy for GMP and CVPS to do it. Super complicated for everyone else. Everyone sort of just decided, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just get back together in the future to discuss it some more, but we don't need to do anything about it now. It's pretty complicated unless you do it statewide. <laughs> I mean, the, the advantage of statewide, regardless of where we fall out, is that it doesn't discriminate against us. It doesn't, it doesn't put us at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis other communities. I mean, one of the things that concerns me is if we have to fund this strictly from our ratepayers, and it is a big increase for the other ratepayers, is it, is it has an adverse effect on economic development in our service territory, which has an adverse effect on jobs, it has an adverse effect on, on housing, it has an adverse effect on everything. Um, and, and, and so all, <laughs> it is, it, it's, 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 Helping to make the poorer parts of the state poorer. Um, well, and to the extent that we aren't, then then you know, I mean, and, and that just to me is bad policy. Now, do you have enough information, Mike, to be confident on Wednesday? Uh, yeah, I think what I'm hearing here is that I need to be open to all options right now and to bring you guys back every bit of information that I get out of that meeting. I don't think we have enough data to have a direction and uh, at least we all understand that at this point. But BEPS is gonna be filing something and the question is, what do we want BEPS to be filing? Because they are ostensibly representing us. Unless, unless we make a statement that says, nope, they don't represent us on this. Correct. 
I, th I think if I got, if I understood from today's call, essentially how they're going to approach this filing is to provide the data that they can provide and was asked for to respectfully decline to propose any of those three options for programs uh, and just say that, you know, there's not enough information to do that at this point. So that filing, I don't think is, is controversial at all. I mean, easier to have VEPSA put together all that data to provide. They're not going to provide any information on the things which we're uncomfortable with. I guess the only other thing that's sort of sitting out there is whether or not you want to participate in a motion to reconsider the PUC's order on their jurisdiction. And I don't, I guess you probably just wait to see what VEPSA's counsel's um, sort of overall opinion is on, on what the argument is and whether or not that would be successful. Yeah, Mike, when you get that, if you could send that to all yeah. of us, that would be, and, and Eli as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think what, I, what I'm hearing, listening to, I haven't heard from Roger or Michael, I, I, particularly on this. I'd like to hear what they have to say. Well, I'm in agreement with, with where we're heading. I'll speak up if I, if I get uncomfortable. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm torn between these poor people who really want to help, but you can't help them with on the backs of other people. And statewide, at least we're sharing it across the state, so it almost makes sense for it to be statewide. But it's, it's a difficult thing because people are just hurting everywhere. And but statewide is also easier to implement. Yes. Which makes it more likely that it will happen. Well, at least that way we're taking what is, we're considering ourselves one of the poorer communities and spreading that over the whole state. Of course, people on the other side are saying, you know, why are they spreading it toward us? We don't want to do it. It's, it's always that problem of if I have it, I don't want to give it to you. But we do want the people who don't have it to have more. And how do you do that? It's, it's such a difficult situation. Well, you, you do it through a progressive tax system. Is how yeah, <laughs> more taxes. So uh, one of the things that um, we also sort of raised back in 2011 was that if you were to do it in Hardwick, you're either gonna have a huge impact on ratepayers. Well, there's likely to be a compromise to make sure the impact to the ratepayers is not too great. And that means reducing the benefit you're gonna provide to the low-income ratepayers. So it's perfectly ineffective. You know, it still imposes a rate increase on people, but not enough of a benefit to actually help low-income people. So it's everybody's unhappy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the only way you can you can sort of minimize the rate impact is just to offer less of a benefit to people. Like right. if that's you right. do it on your own. I guess we're we're I I uh, the question. To me, that's, that's still outstanding is, and I guess we need to see what, what Bill Ellis's uh, opinion is and what BEPSA decides to do, but we're not giving Mike any guidance on what we want BEPSA to do. It is, is, do we want, if, if Ellis comes up with an opinion and, and I think the sense I had from Ken and Eli or others, you know, tell me if, if you disagree with, with my perception, is that Ellis is being asked to give an opinion that the PUC doesn't have the authority. He's not being asked to give um, a reasoned argument either way. No, I don't know. I, 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 I have a lot of respect for Bill. I don't, I think he would, he would give his sort of honest opinion, but I also knowing Bill, he, he'd be very skeptical of PUC jurisdiction. So he probably would be inclined to come out in that direction, but it's my yeah. opinion. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I would think that he, you know, he would give the week. Anyhow, I guess the question 
is if we are of the view that we are better off with a statewide program, do we want to have Mike at the VEPSA meeting advocating for not challenging? Because I don't know that there's going to be a lot of time, because I might understand from Ken that, that, that Bill is supposed to be coming out with this opinion on Wednesday. The VEPSA meeting is at 10 in the morning, so there's a good chance that the VEPSA meeting will be before anybody even sees this opinion or certainly has had time to, to read it and digest it. We could say right now that we will support VEPSA no matter what, or we could say we will support their going to the Supreme Court to challenge the authority, but I'd rather wait. I don't think there's an opportunity to wait, is there? Well. Mike? Well, we can we can step out of the group and do our own thing. That's still fully on the table. No, no I understand to... that, but, but if... I think the question is, are, are we going to be asking you to take a position that we shouldn't go to the Supreme Court? Um, just just quick math. The, uh, the order came out April 26. So if motion to reconsider rehear has to be filed within 30 days. So we have roughly yeah, 10 this is like eight, nine days. days. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have, I, I, I didn't, I didn't do my finger counting on the calendar, but it's. I don't know, that seems awfully precipitous. But basically the, the, yeah, the information has to be provided the, the day after the 30 day clock runs or maybe two days after. Um, Like, I don't see the need why don't, to. Um, why don't we just take the position that we want to go to the Supreme Court, and if if it doesn't, we're where we are today. It doesn't matter, and if it does, okay, so it does. But we, we don't lose anything by saying we want to go. It doesn't mean we have to go. Just our position is we want to go. No, so, but I mean, we do lose if if our if our view is is that we're better off in all likelihood because we don't know for sure, but that we're better off in all likelihood with a statewide. program rather than an, a utility specific program, then. I thought going to the don't want to Court challenge. We don't want to challenge the commission's jurisdiction to impose a statewide program. We just want to fight the battle about what the program is when, when the time comes. Right. But is the PUC suggesting a statewide program? We don't know. That's one of the options. They're not suggesting anything right. yet. That's one of the options that they're instructing right. the staff to look at. So, to me, I think that this is the, the real question is how does Hardwick want to be perceived based on its decision? Because I think there's a strong chance VEPSA uh, challenges the decision and there's a 100% chance Stowe or WEC or some other utility challenges it. So it's gonna be challenged. So it really is just a matter of whether you're participating in that challenge or not. And you know, to me, that's a little bit more of a perception issue. And I think you can totally justify it by saying, actually, we support the statewide proposal. We just wanna make sure the PUC can actually do it. So, you know, we're here participating in this in this uh, appeal. Let, let's... But but not as part of EPSA is what you're saying. Is we make our own filing that, that we don't have that, to make a filing. Says, that, that's a, yeah, you do have to make a filing well, I to just participate and in, say something. How you again? Since it's more of a public perception, it's how do you how do you explain your participation to the world? Not that you really have to do anything unique within the appeal. 
Well, but if they're, well, I'm not following that, Eli, because if, if FEPSA is, is, is making the argument and on our behalf and arguing that the state, that the PUC lacks jurisdiction to impose um, a statewide program, then unless we say something, we are part of that. Yeah, I agree, but what's your motivation? I, I was just looking at what's the motivation for doing it. Could be that you want, you want the PUC to be sure of its authority to be able to do that. I agree that is kind of, that is a very unorthodox way of justifying an appeal, but. Well, and it's not a case or controversy. I mean, then the court wouldn't even have jurisdiction. You could you couldn't you couldn't go for could you in Vermont maybe you can go for an order there's no controversy we we just want the Supreme Court to affirm that the PUC has 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 the authority when no one has challenged it. Still, I guess, I, guess I look at it the other way is if you're the only VEPS member that doesn't do it, how does that look? If it's you know every other member of VEPSA is signing on to the appeal. What does it say about Hardwick? I guess I don't know, but to me, it just, uh, it means something to say that you're not going to participate in the appeal. So maybe that's, to me again, it's, it's whether or not they have the jurisdiction, that question's clearly going to get answered at some point. So you don't sort of have to put yourself out there to participate in that and you're going to get an answer. And in the meantime, you can focus on advocating for your, your, you know, a statewide program if you think that's what's right. That's what I like. Aren't we better off filing something in support of the commission then? And and then and then when when we're into substantive proceedings before the commission, we've sided with them before. We supported them in this. We're the you know. We've, I, I, I agree. I just think that there's, and this is something I'm not, Mike might be a better gauge of this if there's any sort of internal VEPSA issue things with one or more staking out a different position, like the opposite position than VEPSA. Right. So the whole, the whole goal of this special meeting Wednesday is to get all the information on the table and to see if, if we can all agree on the same position and have a unified BEPSA front, or if we can't. Okay. Well, I, re I really think you need to have this meeting before you can decide what your position is with regard to the appeal, because if there's okay. 10 of the members are not in favor of the appeal, then you're part of the majority. So, so maybe we just need to be prepared that we may need to have a special meeting, an emergency meeting sometime um, either later this week or early next week. Yeah, how about Monday? I'm looking at my calendar. That's the 23rd? Yeah. I won't be able to join the 23rd. I've got to make a trip. How about this Friday? Yeah, that could work for me. Um, Fine with me. Friday the 20th. Can we do it earlier? Anytime. Oh, wait a minute. I can't do it. No. What about Thursday? I'm driving to Boston. What about Thursday? I can't do it Thursday night either. What about Thursday during the day? Early afternoon is the only time I could do it. Like 2.30? Is that early now? Yep. I nominate 2.30. Works for me. How about a little earlier? One o'clock. One thirty. 
I have a call one thirty to two thirty. Two okay, two thirty is fine. Two thirty Thursday. Okay, no. I'll get I'll get an invite out. Eli, does that work for you? You might as well join us. Yeah, I have a call at four though, so better wrap up in an hour and a half. Yeah, it it Let's I got. I got to leave by then. Okay. Um, Mike, why don't why don't you go and warn a special meeting? We'll do. Um, and um, yep. if we cancel Lynn, the meeting, we Lynn, do we meeting. have a Hardwick Select Board thing that night, or is that just me or somebody going to the Hardwick Select Board? I think that's just somebody going to the meeting Thursday night. Okay. I have that on my calendar, Mike, if, if you need me to do it. No, the question is, do you need me to go or are you going to go? <laughs> uh, I think we owe you a break where we can give it to you. So if, okay. that, if that appeals I'll, to you. Uh, I'll, I, give I, you a, yeah. I'll give you the bullet list as usual. Great. OK, so. All right. So, Eli, I guess we're done with you for tonight. Thank you very much, sir. Eli, thank you. Yeah, have a good night. Okay, moving back to the agenda. So, the prior meeting minutes. Um, so, we have minutes from the March 21st meeting which we didn't approve at the last meeting because the language on the executive session motions needed to be corrected. And it's still not the kind of motions that we needed to make. <laughs> <laughs> I went back and listened to the video. If I need to change something, I'll be happy to. I think the language should be um, the same as it, as, as it was in the, in the April 18th minutes, where it's it's a motion to move into executive session to discuss a confidential employee matter. Well, now one of the, on the March 21st, it, it says to discuss an employee matter. Do you wanna, are you saying to change that to a confidential? No, no, this is the board. It says there was a motion for an executive session and the language needs to be that whoever made the motion made a motion to move into executive session to discuss a confidential employee matter. Okay. You're talking about on March 21st because I did make a correction to that that was included in the board packets. Yeah, what, what Lynn is getting at, Beth, is there's yeah. some specific- There's magic uh, words. There's special words and statements that you have to make to go into executive session. So I. I'll get those straightened out with Beth Lynn. We'll sign them next okay. time. Okay. Okay. No problem. And then um, Mike and Mike on the April 18th minutes, the very last bullet on the uh, first page. Uh, it says after an evaluation of recent increases and wages. I think that should be in wages. I know it might have sounded like and, but it it should be in. Okay. okay, we'll Got fix it. that. And I wouldn't niggle over that, except that's a pretty important one. Yeah. Good catch. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get both of those straightened out for you for next meeting. Okay. But these can go on the on the website in draft form. Draft. Yep. Are there any other suggested changes to the minutes? Either one? Okay. Do we do we want to approve the minutes with those amendments? And and that way they're approved and they can just be signed. And I know I've got some other stuff to sign, so I can come in. I, I move I move to approve the minutes subject to those changes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Hearing no opposition, the minutes are approved as amended. Yeah.
Okay, so the next item is the ribbon cutting on the 23rd for H11. And it would be good if people come. I regret that I have to make a trip to New York Monday, Tuesday, 23rd, 24th. It could get canceled, but um, at this point, I can't be there. Okay. Roger, we need to coordinate our trips to New York because I'm there now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there this week, you're there next week. We'll do this somehow together. So Chip Will you is going to come that. Yeah, I'll be back. Oh, you'll be back, Michael. Okay, great. Yeah. That's terrific. Okay. So Chip is joining us, and I also reached out late to Senator Kitchell, and she graciously accepted my invitation. She'll be joining us as well. Will she oh, be speaking? Excellent. Will she say a few words? Yes. Good, great. Fabulous. I'm sorry, I'm going to miss it. Hey, Clark. Ten a.m. Yes, Nat. Okay, and the next item on the agenda is... Oh, just so you... I'm going to have uh, a couple bucket trucks down there so that people could go up and take a picture, you know, because you can't really see anything from grade level. Oh, that's cool. Oh, are we, yeah. are we, does our insurance cover for that? I, I don't want to be... <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll have all the right PPE for them to go up and everything. Yeah, it'll be all set. You'll be strapped in, wear a helmet. And the lineman, the lineman will be in the bucket running the controls. So they're just going for the ride. Do we get that waterproof underwear that they all have? <laughs> if it's raining. <laughs> it's scary. It's kind of neat. Well, I guess it's fireproof. I don't know. I... Yeah, flame retardant. That's right. Amazing underwear. <laughs> the waterproof. <laughs> People get nervous in the bucket truck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mike, you want to tell us about the summer event? Okay. Well, what I can tell you is that um, Opie has been getting inundated with uh, inquiries and activities from the Greensboro Beach Association and others. Uh, but yeah, you skipped and an item. You skipped an item. Oh, did I? Oh, I'm you sorry. The employee. I'm sorry. Sorry. Got ahead of myself. Yeah. So I just want to raise awareness and let everybody know, uh, as you certainly recall, we didn't have the Christmas party, uh, but we are going to do the summer event at my house like we did a few years ago. It's July 9th. Uh, it'll be a cookout, you know, lunch cookout, and we'll have cornhole and horseshoes and games to play and i have a pond everybody can go swimming in and we'll get a tent and table set up and a couple of grills and it'll be fun we had a good time last time trying to do a similar event uh it'll be close to brian's 49th anniversary with hardy wow. collector so we'll probably have a cake for, for him and uh, make that part of the day too but I just wanted to get the date, July 9th, everybody aware, mark it off. So hopefully you can join us. It's oh, a great. Saturday, is it, Mike? Yes. <laughs> Saturday, okay. So the food and water, sodas, ice, whatever will be provided. If you'd like your own uh, cool summer beverage, you're welcome to bring it with you. Okay. So the next item is that. the swimming race at uh, Caspian Lake. Yeah. So now I, sorry, now I'll back up again. Uh, so yeah, I hope he's been getting a bunch of stuff. He asked me what to do with this. And I said, well, it's not a select board uh, responsibility. The, the, it's my boards. So why don't you send the thing to me and I'll get it in front of them and let them talk about it and decide whether or not they uh, are okay with it. 
Sounds pretty straightforward to me. I think it's an event that's been going on for yep. the last many years. So, and I think it's a good event. It's attended well. Yeah. So, yeah, I I moved to grant the approval. Good good PR. Okay, so can I just? Uh, I don't want to be. So it says like the Hardwick Electric Company. We're not the Hardwick Electric Company. We're the Hardwick Electric Department. So can I? Yeah, that, say the I Hardwick... we should be. It should be Hardwick Electric Department is co-insured. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just clarify that and say that the Hardwick. I'll write, put it on our letterhead and advise them that the Board of Commissioners has approved their event as requested, except yes. for please straighten this name out. Right. Okay. Yep. I'll get that out of here tomorrow. Okay. So the next item on the agenda is the overdue interest policy and suspending that which we had suspended during the pandemic. Well, it's still during the pandemic, but um, earlier on in the pandemic. Yeah, there's no shortage of jobs though right now. That was the part of the thesis. No, I mean there are yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are shortages of employees is what there are. Ooh, not kidding. Um so how would we be doing this if we you're just reinstating the prior policy, right? Yes. Reverting back to the, the original policy. It was temporarily suspended. And so customers who still haven't paid would then be, I guess my question is. It would begin to accrue on the date you resume. Okay, yeah. we wouldn't be, we would not be accruing. It's not that they would then be, we wouldn't be charging interest over the period when it was suspended. No. It right. would just be starting, yeah. Makes, I'm fine with that. Start. Is there a motion? Do, do, I move to resume the, the policy um, at the start of the month after we announce it, the following month, the, the first of the month following our announcement. Is it at June or is it July, Mike? Hang on. So do we, we Roger, you're proposing that we publicly announce it? Well, you, you know, I was assuming, I was assuming you needed to do that, but probably you don't. Because we, yeah, I think, I think it would be. I, good. I made it. I don't know if that's necessary. I, well, or not. It, what do you guys think? <laughs> it's an interesting question. On the one hand, we're telling people we're going to start charging them late payment interest. On the other hand, we're saying that we haven't been charging them late payment interest yeah. for two years. Right. Um, at, but but it, that in in view of of the fact that people are now able to be out and about and working and moving around. Um, that uh, our it other might have, our, it might our, be better to not say anything. It may be it. better, yeah. But it, it there's some value though in giving people notice. Maybe maybe a, rather than a public announcement, maybe notifying the customers who are affected. Who are in arrears? Yeah, people who are, who are behind. That that you know, know that, the that we over. you know we will be reimposing this, and if they don't want to be start accruing. They need to. Well, why don't we, it goes out on a, on a, on their bill only on their bills. Can we do that easy enough and say July one? What when? No. Go ahead, Beth. That's going to be difficult. Difficult to isolate those customers for just a mo oh. message on their bills. Could well, you we just do a separate? We could put a message. Or? We but could put a message separate. on all bills advising everybody. But just our rate payers. No, that's what we were thinking. That's that's like a public announcement. Well, it's not like in the paper. You have to be a ratepayer to receive the message. Yeah, but that 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 still understood. Uh, but but I don't like starting to put a charge on that people haven't been paying for two years <laughs> without telling them that it's it's going to be. I guess one question that I have. Um, 
so these this, there there are arrearages that the arrearages are still there and they haven't been charged interest um and these customers have a payment uh, have a repayment program or don't or beth how many customers do we have uh in arrears due to co actually how many do do we have in arrears in our last couple of uh disconnect processes actual disconnects uh, less than 25 uh less than 50 for the month so this is we could certainly divvy up the 50 customers and call them directly now those are ones that are subject to disconnect those are not necessarily the ones that have just paid late that would have approved this interest no, no, but I'm asking about the arrearages because um, if some if someone's on a payment plan, do they keep accruing on on their arrearages or 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 then they're on the payment plan and there's no interest? That's what I was trying to get at. We have not been accruing anything. If we start using, if we start using the accrual, if even if they have a payment plan, it would accrue the interest if it's not paid time one one point five percent per month yep how, how, much, how, much, how much is it mike one point five percent per month one point five percent of the total that they owe us or only of the new bill the new bill of this yeah the only of the new bill yes oh that's okay no it yeah, should it's be not on the it should be the total past due amount. Yeah. You charge interest on your past due balance. Right. Past due balance. I mean, right. if we're not inventing. The first things first, do we want to reinstate the old policy? And then there's a second question. Do you want to fiddle around with change the old policy? Okay. Fair enough. I was proposing that we return, we just sort of resume the existing policy. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. I second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay, Passes. perfect. Okay, that's fine. In person meetings, or not? Uh, why not? Unless everybody's going to wear masks, um, yeah, we're not we're not in a good place right now. In we're in a very bad place right now, actually. Stay on Zoom. Stay on Zoom, then. Unless we're going to meet outside. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, now um, we're on the, the dam request. Yeah, so uh, a couple of customers have been uh, making some win inquiries and, and doing taking some efforts on uh, environmental aspects of our dams and facilities. And one of those individuals ended up with Matt and had some questions and Nat wants to be able to go back to her with some responses. So I said, well, probably the best way to get you some responses to throw is to throw it out here for a Q and A and I'll answer any questions you all have. So Nat, go ahead first. Well, so there, there are two dams in question, but particularly Mike is referring to the Hardwick Lake, so-called Jackson Street Dam. And uh, so they, they wanted to know what's the condition of the dam what's the future what are our plans i said we have no plans uh what's the future of the dam and mike has told me that actually we could erase that dam and it would affect almost nothing um it's so, a hardwick lake <laughs> well, well the, not much of that yeah hard hardwick lake uh, i think 80 percent of it is less than 18 inches deep when the dam is in play uh, when the dam is closed we open it uh, and drain the lake in November before the ice starts to form. And then we reform the dam. Uh, the loons call us and let us know they're coming next Tuesday and we make sure the, that it's filled up for them on Tuesday. 
Uh, but it's always drained because when it's not drained in the winter, it's always drained for the winter because if it is not, it uh, inevitably leads to flooding uh, due to the ice jams in the village. Yeah. When do you, when do you fill it, Mike? No, uh, before, usually like the first week of November, we'll fill it up. But if, if, if the dam was taken down, it would destroy the habitat for the loons and the eagles. That's and, right. And there would no longer be any kayaking on the lake, which there is now. That's right. And so if, if, if we drained it, that would be an environmental problem. In the, yeah. I mean, if, the, if we, you, took, you if we got rid of the, the dam entirely, which would drain the year round, it would, be, it would, it would create issues okay. for habitat for birds. Right. Okay, we drain and it. That, right that, that, is, that is exactly the conclusion uh, that a, a big board or a committee was formed to consider removal of that dam about 17 years ago. I have that report somewhere. And it was unanimous by the board. It was unanimous by the community that they wanted it staying just like it is, making the pond or the lake in the summer and being drained in the winter. And that's what's been going on ever since. Now, tell me again, when you drain it and when you fill it. You fill it in November, you drain it when? We drain it in November. Yeah, then? And then we fill it uh, when the ice is gone. There's no more risk of an ice jam in the spring. So, I mean, what has that been, about now? Uh, no, I would say it's usually uh, the first part of March. Okay. And I think the loons get here sometime around the end of April, normally. But there's a guy, there's a couple of people that monitor all that, and they usually so the check total, in with us. Huh? The total height of that dam is only about seven feet? Uh, 14 feet. 14 feet. Um, and oddly enough, we have control of that water, not the state. Yeah, the state doesn't get involved because of the flood control. Because they, they don't even they don't even they don't even inspect that dam. Okay, we have no plans for the future on that dam. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, we do have plans. The plan is to make is to keep the dam. Okay. Well, right. We have no development plan. We have no we have no plans to change what we've been doing. Correct. Okay. Um, okay. On the other hand, the Caspian Lake Dam, we do not oh, have control I, over. Yep. Yeah. Can I interrupt with the Hardwick? Um, the Eric Remick connection, Mike, where the people working on the rail trail want to know if you could change something with the dam. It, is that something that, that we can authorize you to do to just be helpful to them? Um, well, the I believe the water's back down to where they can do their the work they needed now. Yeah. Um, and I would be very wary of getting the loon people upset oh, yeah. uh, by changing the water level. Uh, there's quite a team of them. They're pretty organized. They're well supported. And yep. there, there's plenty of trail those guys can work on until the water gets down to where they can do their thing on that, that one stretch. And that naturally comes down in the coming weeks. Months. Oh, it's down. It's already down. They can get in there where they want it to go now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Caspian, like most dams, is entirely controlled by the state. Change? Yes. And the water, and that, the water yeah. level is entirely controlled by the state. Right. Yes. Uh, if that and that dam is inspected from time to time by the state. Correct. It is. It, is it is there a rating for it right now well it's a it's a relatively old dam and they they call it poor condition because it has concrete erosion and uh you know it's not the prettiest dam but it's fully functional the gate is fully functional uh the spillways are intact and spilling the water the way they should be uh, there's no back erosion on the spillway, which is one of the big concerns they check for every year. Um, and we do anything that they, that the dam safety program uh, says, hey, you really need to do this. For example, a couple of years ago, they said, boy, you got to get rid of all these cedar trees on this dam. That's the worst tree. And the worst thing you can have for this dam is trees on it, especially cedar trees. 
because of the root system. So we went in and we cut all the trees down. Right. Um, right. And then a couple of years went by and they didn't give us any of those kinds of recommendations. And I think a year ago, maybe two years ago, we got the recommendation about getting the uh, something at the spill, the, the falling water of the spillway to ensure there was no back erosion under the dam. And that's what those big granite slabs are that I had moved in there. We're just waiting for the water to get low enough again that we can put an excavator in there and put them down in there. So that was another one of the things with the dam safety guy uh, engineer, uh, Mr. Green said, hey, you really need to do this. This has been a concern. And uh, so we're gonna do it. Those things we always go do. And we already had the discussion that, you know, we're not about to sell that land. And if we did, we would want to sell it to somebody who kept the public uh, access for boats and public beach, which would mean nobody's interested. Well, we, I don't think we've made a determination that we're not going to sell the land. No, but we said, but we did say if we did, we would keep it as a public beach and a public waterway. We did? We never well, took a vote on that, but that seemed to be the consensus. That seemed to be the consensus. No, I mean, nobody can, I mean, there's there's no proposal now, nor will there be. I mean, I'm not inviting- That's, that's where, that's where, that's where I'm, I, I the nor will there be is, is <laughs> no, <worse. laughs> We have a guy, we have a guy who wants to come and make a proposal to us. I said, well, what's the proposal? He said, well, we'll talk about it. I mean, Are you talking I, from them? I was talking from us. Well, no. I, I mean, this guy, John Schweizer, wants to come to one of our meetings. I said, I'm not going to invite you, John. It's a public meeting. You can come at any time, but you don't have a proposal, and you don't have money, and you don't have authority. Well, that's your view. Yeah, that's that's not the way I would sort of put it to him. Well, how would you put it to him? I would say he's welcome to come to the meeting and, I said and, that. and, and speak to us. I just wouldn't no. add the stuff about the, the, no. the <laughs> you know he you, you, you don't you don't want that land. He'll talk for an hour. I, I, we can cut him off. You know, we can limit the amount I, of time I, he has. I, I cut him off already. Speaking okay. from <laughs> speaking from personal experience, I don't think that would be a good experience for you all. All right. No, no. He's a, he's a good guy, but all right. But, I have, all the information I want. If you have questions of my fine. I don't have any questions. I would just add that I got an email from Eric um, asking about Macville Dam and uh, spoke with Mike earlier, uh, who filled me in on the history. And you know, I think, uh, but for fish and wildlife, it sounds like we would be investigating uh, repowering at. at at, at the Macfill Dam, and uh, that one damn fish the guy caught. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, the thing I I talked to Lena uh, about that, and I, as I shared with her, the the brainstorm came through my skull about uh, the H eleven remediation area and oh, you guys cut wood over here. So you're going to have to remediate here, which is all still in the works too. But along those lines, I approached the agency of natural resources and I said, Hey, you know, on this project over here, uh, you allowed us to remediate another area for doing some work over here. Why couldn't we do a similar swap where, Hardwick Electric could buy you 500 trout or a thousand trout every year. And the state can take those trout and put them in the best, you know, hatchery, the best <laughs> environment in the state and build your hatchery because this certainly isn't it. There's no trout here. And boy, they didn't even want to talk about that. Nope, not open for discussion. Got to get your friend in there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. The next item on the agenda is a monthly financial and customer service update from Beth, who has been sitting there very patiently. <laughs> um, Mike, on the first financial report goes, Mike covered most of it in his um, general manager report. Uh, of course, uh, the thing, 
two bigger, two biggest things are our revenue and the VEPSA power bill. Those are big contributing factors. And then over on the expense side of our VEPSA rec credits are running higher, but they will level out. And then the vacation pay that we misbudgeted. But one thing I did want to mention specifically that is not read readily viewable is um, I did a deep dive into our uh, transportation vehicles that we had on the books. And I found about $400,000 worth of transportation equipment and associated depreciation that was on our books that I have removed. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing that you readily see because it really didn't affect the balance sheet because 99% of it was completely depreciated. Good cleanup though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm still looking. So are there any other questions or comments on the the actual financial. I, I, yeah, I had one on on um, on the key indicator summary. It, it just kind of jumped out at me, and and maybe this is the vacation pay, but it's it's one heck of a lot of vacation pay. Um, the difference between the budget and actual on year to date was really large on 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 A and G. Yeah. Wondered wondered what what that was from. There was a lot. There was a lot of vacation pay, and I'm sorry. Did you say between the actual and the budget? Between actual and budget, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're we're that's, we're that's the one. That's I'm the one sorry. that Mike mentioned. It, that's the one that Mike mentioned in his general manager section. Uh, the budget. Uh, what was it? Can you put it? It was under budgeting. Maybe I just didn't connect the dots. No, I wondered about that too. I didn't understand it. Let me go back over here to his. Yeah, it's, it's in the last paragraph of his report. Is it? Under budgeting I, vacation. I don't, I, don't, I don't see, I mean, I don't see it. Under, under budgeting vacation pay for the team. Uh, where 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 are you? Where are you? I'm on page fifty-five, the last okay, paragraph. The general manager. Okay, report. hang on. I gotta, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm looking at the at the last paragraph of the general manager's report, and I'm not seeing um a hundred and a hundred and 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 oh no he, 30, he no he didn't reference the dollar amount. He referenced um under budgeting vacation pay for the team. That's where the and, that, and that's one hundred and thirty thousand. That's a, that's a hell of a lot of vacation pay. I'm trying to find my notes. actual versus okay. budget. Well, maybe I'm looking at the wrong thing. So let me go back and look. We're talking about the first page of your of your stuff, page twenty four. Yep. Key indicators. Yep. Administrative in general, actual versus budget. The actual was 124 and the budget was 113. No. No. I'm looking on page 24. 24. Actual was 428,000 and the budget was 295,000. And we're on page 24. Well, that's what yep. it says at the bottom of the page. This is year to date, not March, for the month. March oh. 2022. Yeah, I have okay. my stuff in front of me. Key I have indicator. my stuff in front of me. What's the question? Yeah, on page 24, the key indicators. It, yeah. A and G administrative general. in general. No, not for the month. month the year, year to date. The year to date, actual versus budget differs by 125,000 plus. Yeah. Different. Why? Yeah. So, what account numbers are those, Beth? Um, they're all on page twenty-nine.
Is there any way to get the headers to repeat on pages on the on the operating oh, statement? Because I'm constantly flipping back and forth. I don't know, trying to. Um, I'm, they, they're there, but they're because the pages went landscape. They're actually on the right side. Oh, okay. Anyway, all right. So, so this holiday pay. Yeah, that was only about five thousand dollars Beth. yeah uh, Lynn the we had a 10 almost 11,000 of it was some rec credits that got accounted for incorrectly and Beth fixed that that was an A&G yep 923.05 was the account number oh that's what that so what is outer that's VEPSA what does that mean uh so that's like if we use VEPSA services for IT support. So Kim and Ken will come up here and uh, re fix our firewall for a problem or they'll order us a laptop or whatever we need for IT support. We get bills for that directly as a, as a side expense and service from VEPSA. Okay, and I'm, see, I'm seeing where the big items are. The other big item is, is employee benefits, which is health insurance. Yep. Retirement, health insurance, all that stuff. Yeah. All those bets are right. Parking so there was also <laughs> there was also a twist in this um, where where actually I'm not going to say that because I don't think that I'm right. I don't think I'm right. I'm not going to say that. Uh, I'm not sure about the hundred thousand dollars difference, but we can dig into that and get you a good answer. Yeah. I guess I guess my question is 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 this something that's likely to be recurring? Because if it is, that's that's a pretty significant deviation from budget. Yep. Well, we'll get you a good answer. No problem. And I'll just get that response about that back to you all in an email. Yes. And down below that is good news, where the Walcott Hydro is far exceeding its actual kilowatt hours compared yeah. to its budgeted. So that's great yeah. to see. Yeah, we've had plenty of water, that's for sure. Is part of that effectiveness of the Walcott Hydro because of the changes, the repairs we've made in the last year or two? Or is it just... Uh, Good luck. Nothing to do. Nothing to do with the concrete work we did, but yes, oh. having to do with the turbine work we've been doing, uh, with the consultant out of Ontario, changing uh, the operating parameters. I think I told you about all that. that we we're going to try and tweak the generator to get more out of it, uh, run it a little faster, a little harder, and make sure that was still going to uh, not decrease the life of the unit or damage it thermally or electrically. And we did that. And it's showing, so. That's great. I also had a question on page 25. Um, I'm looking at the bottom of the page at net income year to date in the budget and March in the budget. And I understand how actual year to date net income could be less than the net income for a particular month. But are we, do we actually forecast negative net income for some months? So that. For some months. Yeah. Yeah. It has to or is be this because, or is this because we put in the actuals into the budget? Correct. It's, both. it's because yes. the actuals went into the budget. Okay. Yes. That's what. I... That's what I thought I was going to comment on, but I couldn't remember correctly. Yes, <laughs> you're correct. Okay. <laughs> That was in the um, accounts payable. Who is Main Street Law LLP? I mean, it's not a huge amount, but I just wondered who they were. That's Scott Cameron. Oh, is that is that his firm's name now? Yeah, okay. he he uh, he and his partners have uh, well the bit their office building that beautiful building they had in Montpelier I believe they sold it and now they're 
basically working out of their small offices or home offices. And Scott has all but retired, but we're one of the customers that he kept and wants to keep working with. So we're lucky to have him. Absolutely. Um, okay, was there anything on customer service, Beth? Uh, one thing before we get to customer service, y'all had asked for a budgeted 2022 cash flow projection. And that is on page 52. Oh, yeah, I have had developed. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because I had a question about that. I thought we also wanted to see monthly cash flows because okay. just knowing what it is for the, you know, what it is on the budget for the year doesn't um, okay. tell us how we're doing. Okay. And, and so it would be good to see um, each month how we're so doing. Also, uh, as I recall, uh, Lynn and Roger had offered up to give us some examples that we never got. So if you guys could forward those along, I'm sure she can use them to build this uh, into more of what you want. Okay, fair enough. Roger, okay. I can hear you. What were you saying, Sonny? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, that might have been long ago that I forgot. No, it was uh, last month. So that, that you know, well, that's maybe too long ago. It's like a so long. Time. That's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Just wait, Mike. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm thrilled to be available to help. I don't know what I'm going to pull out of my back pocket to throw your way. <laughs> this was on cash flow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you have something great, if you don't, that that's okay too. We can work with this. I just did. It might be a model that, you know, works great for everybody. That, that's all. Yeah. Okay. Was there anything on, on customer service, Beth? Yes. I just want to do a few things that we have talked about and to give you an update on it. We had talked about the answer message that you get when you call the office. It's long and it's complicated. We have streamlined that and we have changed that. Yeah, and yeah. I welcome you to call and make sure you're, that it meets the expectations. I think it's much, much better. Um, we have also changed our front office hours, instead of closing at 3.30 on Wednesday and Friday, we're gonna be open till four, just like every other day. So for consistency, for us, for our customers, 7.30 to four, That's Monday good. through Friday. Uh, That's good. Sounds good. We're going, for our messages, we're gonna have a different message daytime versus non-working hours, and also a completely different message for holidays. Um, okay, we've got new credit card devices coming in. We That is security for our customers and their information. They are coming in. We haven't installed them yet. We're working with BEPSA because they take a network connection, but we've got them and they're going in. Um, on the website, I have added on the page where customers pay their bills, customer account page, I have added links to the three agencies that we currently work with to help customers pay their bills. So the customers can go directly to those websites Great. to, to um, apply for assistance. We had talked about um, emails for the board members on the website. So I talked with our web developer and he wanted to make sure you're aware of this information and then y'all decide how you want to go forward. He is concerned that if you put your email address directly on the website so that when the customer clicks on your name, your email address appears, he can absolutely do that. We can do that. However, he said he did want to caution that Autobots, there are thousands of Autobots software out there scanning websites and they can pick up your email addresses and you will get slammed with scam if your email address gets picked up. So he offered a couple of other options for you. It can be a generic pop-up window that has a message to the commissioner, and it can have a drop-down menu that the customer says, this is the commissioner I want it to go to. That email will go to a general Hardwick Electric email address that 
someone here would monitor. Either you can designate a commissioner or I can monitor Mike, whatever. We would monitor that and then take that message and forward it directly to your personal email addresses. From that point, you could have the option to respond directly back to the customer and then they would have your email address. Or you could respond back to the generic email box and then the person monitoring it here could forward it on out to the customer. But he just, he said he'd be glad to put your personal email addresses on the website, but just wanted you to be aware that if it gets picked up, you might be hit with a lot of scam emails. I understood there was another option. I'm sorry, Mike, what did you say? Yeah, I thought I understood there was another option where well, uh, go ahead. you could have a template pop up that the customer would fill in and that would go directly to the email the commissioner had provided. But going through that extra step is a security level that eliminates bots and scanning devices, scanning he, software looking for email addresses. He said that was not an option. Okay. It was it being discussed? Because that's what I understood. We had we had kind of talked about it, yes, but the website okay. developer said that would not work. Okay. So the options but what what I'm sorry. Go ahead. The problem here is because people want to use their personal emails and not use their Hardwick Electric emails. Is that why? It's, I got a I got a a, a, requ a request from Eric last week, and I said I would bring it up at the at the board meeting. So I'm glad that you, that, that that you're bringing it up, pointing out that that the commissioner's email addresses were not on the website, and I point and I replied to him. Well, part of the thing that we needed to discuss is because people use their individual emails, not their Hardwick Electric emails. Uh, the, the select board members, for example, have their addresses on the select board's website or on their page on the town website. Um, but that they, they're all using hardwickvermont.org, not, right. not their personal emails. What did we used to have? Did we have our telephone yeah. numbers? We had something. No, we did not have anything. We should have. We didn't. No, and, we, and what we had, what we originally had was a uh, community uh, board of commissioner address that anybody could send an email to. And the commissioners rotated responsibility for that email address, which got lost in the noise and yeah. Never, never, it didn't work and people got pissed because they weren't getting their emails responded to. So that went out the window, but that's how it was done originally. Yeah, but I think, I think, um, I don't like the idea of, of the emails that we get being monitored. If somebody is contacting a commissioner, they want to contact the commissioner. Right, so I agree I think, with that. I, th I, I think people that. need to decide if, if this, you know, I'm fine. I'm forewarned. Put my AOL address on there. If it becomes a problem, you know. Well, decide what to do. An option that I didn't specifically mention, but is available if you wanted to use the hardwickelectric.com email, that would be something that would come in here in our own email monitoring software that we use for our network to help eliminate the scam and the garbage emails. Couldn't be set up with an automatic forward to forward it to people's personal emails if they want it coming. So in other words, they wouldn't have to monitor their Hardwick Electric email, but it would forward whatever came in. That to, seems to be something we could do. Let's find I out can about check that. On that. Yeah, that makes is then, sense. So, so, so then maybe for the time being, because I know the select board is. Uh, you know, would like to see some some uh, some action on this, to put in everybody's Hardwick Electric addresses, and and then for people who don't want to be monitoring their Hardwick Electric address, just set it up to forward everything that comes in on that to their personal email, and and then it's coming through the security of Hardwick Electric, so it should yeah. be pulling out any stuff that shouldn't go through. You guys can do that, Mike. That sounds like a good option, and yeah, I believe we can do that. 
I'm perfectly happy to have my telephone number on there instead, if that's an option. People can find our phone numbers. I mean, you know, I get I get phone calls from people who have managed to get my phone number because um, I, I don't have an unlisted number. Um, but I don't I don't especially want to be putting my phone number out, and and we're not being asked to. We are asked. To, we do need to get our emails out there, though. I yeah. understand that. Good. So we got a plan. Okay. Yep. I mean, those of us who are in the phone book, there's no problem. Somebody can look that up. And they do. And they do. All right. So we'll, Beth, we'll circle back with our provider and make sure that the two-step yep. email can be done and we'll let you yep. know. Well, okay. then. That's all I've got. If it, if it can't be done. People want to. I, I know that Roger does not want to mo monitor his Hardwick Electric. What about Nat and, and Michael? Oh, heavens no. I'd rather have my phone number on there or even my email address. I prefer to have it forwarded. If you can't forward, I'll monitor my Hardwick email. I don't care. I'll have an answer tomorrow. Okay. Um, so that takes us to the general manager's report. Any questions, comments? Can we put a dog okay. by the uh, powerhouse? <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I guess my, my only question on the security issue was whether, you know, given Opie's background, whether you had discussed it with Opie or with the um, acting police chief as to what their recommendations might be. I, I know from, from that another organization that I'm involved with where we had some security concerns, we spoke with the, you know, the police chief of, of the town and, and he had some good suggestions for us. Yeah, I actually Cameras, spoke cameras are a tricky business. If you're not monitoring it, it helps you after the fact, it doesn't stop it from happening in the first place. Yeah. So yes, I, it just so happened that I had a field trip scheduled with Opie to the hydro uh, right when I got back from vacation. So we met and talked about the break-in and yes, he made some good recommendations. And I'm, I have a meeting scheduled with the vendor that provides the camera equipment and services up at our P10 peaking unit up in Swanton. They just redid the whole system up there at P10 and uh, they're going to show me what they have, what they can do, et cetera. And uh, I'll enlighten you as soon as I know more about that. Yeah, buildings that have copper drain pipes. Sometimes they come in the middle of the night and take the whole drain pipe away. Yeah. Yep. We're adding, we're, so a couple of things we're doing that are real simple that I think will be helpful deterrence are we're adding a bunch of flood lighting down in there, but we're also moving the gate up to Route 15 because at night you can park a car down in that driveway and nobody can see you, you know? So yeah. we're gonna, we're gonna put the gate so that you have to park on Route 15. Your car will be sitting there for all to see if you go down in there. Right. Any other questions or comments? Any other business? Um, I would like to move that we have a brief, uh, and after this motion, I think um, if there's a way that meeting can be kept on, as I would like to be moving to have a brief executive session just with the commissioners to discuss a, a, a confidential employee matter. I'll make the motion. I'm not making the motion yet. Um, but um, it, it's largely in the, in, it's, it's a procedural thing, but we need to have that discussion. Um, so, um, but then we would be moving to adjourn. If, if Mike is the host, he could make somebody else a co-host. Which is me I can now. Do whatever you want. Right. 
Click, uh, click on Lynn. If, if Mike click, clicks on Lynn's picture, one of the options coming up should be co-host. Or maybe. I can, can say make co-host. Yep, there you go. Okay, I, I haven't just, gotten a I am the co-host now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to move uh, that we go into executive session to discuss a confidential employee matter. Is there a second? Second. Am I Sorry. staying here or am I going? What's You're going? going. You're going. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thursday at, Thursday at 2.30 and you'll send us an invite, Mike. Yeah, I got that set up right now. So it is 7.20 and we are going into executive.